risk, if you're taking it from a risk perspective, there's a risk of very high temperature change. Um, the second point that I think is really important, and this is another area where we use the integrated assessment modeling, is that this, isn't, this is not an OECD issue. Okay? So this is showing emissions from the OECD and the non-OECD countries in these reference scenarios. And historically, of course, the OECD um, was the most important, but the non-OECD you know, surpassed the OECD, and that's where most of the growth is supposed to come from. And so in the IPCC context, or in the negotiating context, again, coming from the models, and you see these gigantic ranges. Uh, but this is pretty typical, but the fact is it's really typical because of the assumptions about population and GDP in those countries. It's really driven by the assumptions. If you were to go in and say, that India, China, Africa are never going to grow, then we would have a different result. It's really based on the assumptions of what's going to happen in those countries. Okay, so then that's just the, the backdrop um, of where we're headed if we do nothing. So then the next question that Working Group 3 asks is what does it take to actually get down to uh, 2 degrees C with a likely chance? Likely means 66%. Okay. What does it take to get down to a 66% chance? So there's many ways to do that from a sort of techno technical perspective, but doing so um, poses um, substantial technological, economic, social, and institutional challenges. So it's hard. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what's, what it takes. So here's a chart um, that comes directly from work group three. And this shows the results from all the different scenarios we have. So here's the category where they ended up at the end of the century, less than 430. We didn't really look at, but 450, 500, 550, 580 to 650. So these two are surrounding 650 and then, and then so forth. Um, and then for the very deep emissions reductions, we had to look about whether it had overshoot or not overshoot concentrations. Okay. But the key thing that you get to is these temperature statements over here on the right. And I think I highlighted those. So this is the key point here. So here's one and a half degrees, two degrees, three, and four. And this is the likelihood to stay below that level this century, okay? So the only one that is likely to stay below two degrees are the 450 scenarios, okay? None of the other are likely to stay below two degrees. If you want to stay below three degrees, you go all the way up to 650 by the end of the century and still have a good chance of staying below two degrees, okay? So this is how I just said what I, what I said. And for what it's worth in the climate negotiations now, they've moved from two degrees to one and a half degrees. So a lot of the small island states, for example, are pretty concerned about going underwater. And, and so they, they're pushing to have one and a half be the goal. Okay. So as you can see here though, one and a half, more unlikely than likely, these scenarios that are getting to 450 are less than likely, they're less than 50% chance of staying below one and a half degrees. So as you think about the negotiations, you think about um, first the two degrees and then the one and a half. As I go through what it takes, you can think about how reasonable one and a half sounds as well as how reasonable two, two sounds. But this is all, again, coming from, we run the integrated assessment models, okay? And we run them to meet these goals, these different goals. And then in this case, all of the output was run through magic, which again is the little climate model we use. And with 600, this probabilistic distribution of 600 outcomes, which is ostensibly, it's a Monte Carlo, it's ostensibly capturing you know, some best estimate of the uncertainty distribution itself. That's a question. So it's real, this is all an, this is an all an IA exercise. They use they made them use the same climate model though, so that it would be sturdier under scrutiny. Because some of the models use some of the IA models use different climate models. So they try to put them all through one single climate model. And Magic's been heavily vetted. It's used also in working group one. So any questions about this? this idea. Okay. And so we calculated the likelihood of all these different all these different scenarios. Now let me show you one thing that's kind of interesting. You'll see here that this, the best this says is likely. So right here it says it's likely to stay below four degrees, okay? Um, so let's, let's take it, 450, it's likely to stay below two degrees, it's 
it's likely to stay below three, it's likely to stay below four. Okay, so likely to stay, why is it like really likely? There's actually other categories, exceptionally likely, very likely. There's other categories. But the reason it actually only reads likely is because the folks in working group one felt that their understanding of the climate system through their modeling was not sufficient to put anything higher than likely or lower than less likely. So they, although we might have gotten like, this is probably like 90, let's say it's 96% chance staying below two, 40 degrees. For us, when you look at the guidance from the IPCC, that should actually be like very likely or exceptionally likely. But in working with the climate modelers, they say, well, really, we don't understand the tails, of the, we don't understand the distributions well enough to make anything more than 66 or 33. So that's why it only goes to likely and unlikely. You see, there's a little bit of a note here where it says that uh, it explains what the distributions were very, very unlikely with the distributions we use. Okay, so then the question is, what does that mean about emissions reductions? So when you're thinking about the climate negotiations, this is what they're talking about. So here's the reference, the baseline reference scenario range, okay? That's, uh, this is actually, the baseline range is actually here. These look greater than 1,000 parts per million. But the baseline range is around here. Okay? So this is showing emissions over the century, right? Here is likely chance of staying below three degrees. These are scenarios from 580 to 620, sort of 650 scenarios, roughly speaking. And here's the two degree scenarios. So this is what they're negotiating around, is the notion of trying to get to here from up there. Okay. And these are all, again, runs from integrated system models. So to give you a little bit of background on these, going up to, um, if you, let me see, I think coming up to the development of the RCPs, nobody had run anything much below three three watts per meter squared. There was a big sort of uh, discussion and then a little bit of a brouhaha at an early meeting in the RCP process where they decided to go with 2.6 and they noted that one team had run a 2.6, but nobody had run a 2.6 before. But they still decided to include a 2.6 as part of the RCP process, okay? But it hadn't really been done. But coming up to the end of AR5, all of the modeling teams knew that two degrees was what the discussions were all about. And there were probably three or four studies, all of them focused on these 2.6, these 450 scenarios as a core part of what they did. So there's, the Europeans had a large study called Ampere. There was something called EMF 27. Um, there was the Asian modeling exercise. There was a limit study. All of these studies were rushing to get done by the time where you have to have your papers accepted so that they could be included in this database. So we went from almost no scenarios down here over like a three year period to tons and tons of scenarios in this range um, so that we could support this analysis in the IPCC. Yeah. So you have there like uh, almost again decreasing of uh, emission towards the end of the century. Mm -hmm. um, opposite to almost minimal like, increasing of uh, economic development and population. Right. So it's not like, a, well, that's quite difficult. So according to the, to the simulation you have work, and uh, what is the tricky part? Is technology, is policy, the... Um, so we'll, let me see, I'll, hopefully we'll go through some, some of that. Um, you said, so you said what's the hard part or what's the... Yeah. Yeah, um, so let's see if I can answer that. Hopefully I'll be able to work it through. So. It's a huge increase in the deployment of low carbon technology. And if it's a scenario where, I mean, that's the bottom line. In the end, that's the bottom line is there's two things you do. You lower energy intensity, so less energy per GDP, or you put in a ton of low carbon energy. That's really what it ends up being. And in general, um, the models are less sensitive on the energy demand side, so it's a lot of low carbon energy. I'll show you a figure later, but you know, you're talking six, seven times what we had today by 2050. So enormous amounts of low carbon energy. That's, that's largely where it's happening. So it's I'm trying to sort of answer you as we go along. I'm just trying to kind of work myself through the logic. It's 
It's really this sense that we don't assume, we assume a continued economic growth. You can always do it by just tanking economic growth, but we're not doing that, okay? So you're assuming continued economic growth. You're assuming continued demand for energy services. And so you really have two ways built into the model that's kind of a gap in time for actual full implementation of policies, which is to say, policy decided, set, starting in period zero, boom, let's see what happens, or is it like, this is gonna take 20 years to actually implement before we see. <laughs> right, that's a, great, that's a great question. It's a great question because I'm gonna address it in a moment, okay. and so that's that's why I really like it. Okay. Um, but yeah, absolutely, <laughs> so traditionally, that's how a lot of this was done, was just starting today, today. Uh, full global carbon price starting today. That's you know picked so that it increases over time at the rate of interest, which is economically efficient for those who are inclined towards that. And that's what a lot of these are. But those ones up here are not. These are what are called delay scenarios. So there's a lot of scenarios that delayed action till 2030 and then tried to see what that would imply. And I'll go through an example of that in just a moment. But if you go to the UN, UNEP GAP report, they're using all this same stuff, all these same model runs. And they're now, on the last round, they did go to a lot more of the delay stuff, but traditionally what they would have done is taken the idealized scenarios, these perfect implementation scenarios, and then said, how far are we off from that? With, without really acknowledging that just getting things rolling takes time. So now, actually, the reason I'm late is because we're working on this right now, but the big, the big question now that everyone's asking is what about Paris? So there's gonna be this outcome of Paris. That's gonna lead us to some sort of spot on here, and I probably, I, I should have included a slide. Maybe if I have time, I'll run up during the break. But it's gonna lead us to a particular spot, okay? And the question then is, that's a delayed scenario. We kind of know ostensibly where we're gonna to get to in 2030, assuming everybody does. You guys familiar with Paris? The, so, so all the countries are putting together their, their um, intended, is it intended? I can never remember. Nationally determined contributions. What they're gonna do over the next 10, 15 years. So let's say, let's say through 2030, although some are through 2025. And so it's really letting us know what's gonna happen by 2030 if the countries actually do what they say they're gonna do. So now it actually gives us a chance to say, okay, we'll be here, let's say. What does that mean going forward? So that's where all the integrated assessment modelers right now, that's what they're all doing, is they're saying, oh, I gotta get a paper out over the next month before, <laughs> before the negotiations on the implications of those and what it means for you still want to get to for um, This is an important number, 40 to 70 percent below 2010 levels by 2050. That's a key number that came out of the report. I should note, however, that many of the ones that are only 40 percent are scenarios that are going negative in the second half of the century. And then that's the second point, is that in many scenarios we have negative emissions in the second half. In fact, there's some that go all the way down to like here. We have runs that go all the way down to here using huge amounts of bio CCS. If you allow that kind of unmitigated bio CCS, you can get tremendous number of emissions. Okay. So this is what we're talking about. And I'm both giving you the outcomes from working group three, but I'm also noting this is all from the integrated set models. And so what we'll try and do this week is run a scenario that's an idealized scenario that just gets you down here and then say what happened to the energy system. So I'm trying to replicate this style of analysis. Okay, so then starting to get at these questions. So reaching 450 are characterized by a nearly tripling to a nearly quadrupling of the share of zero and low carbon energy. So here's where we are today. Share, if I can't remember what it is, but it's like 18% or maybe it's 15%. Here's 2030. And here is, in 2050, you're talking about 60% share of low carbon energy. And that is in 35 years. So this, this would be a classic use of IA models to be able to understand the evolution of the energy system to meet a particular goal. And it's not astringent if we're not going for the 450. So actually, let me make sure I've explained this. This is the share of low carbon primary energy. So the share of, actually I should say what low carbon means. Nuclear power. Some people have concerns about hydroelectric power, which some people have concerns about, wind power, solar power, and fossil or um, biomass power with CCS or biomass. All of those are low carbon energy. Okay? And this is the share of those in the total energy system. This is where we are today. This is where we would need to be by 2050.
Okay, so the next point is to do this, one of the great things about having an integrated assessment approach is that you can actually look at the different sectors and their sectoral contributions to mitigation. So this is showing emissions in the baseline across um, six main sectors of the economy. Let me kind of explain the chart. And then I'm gonna go through an animation, okay? So this is land use, this is land use change emissions, okay? This is electricity emissions, okay? Transport, you know, so cars, and freight and so forth, uh, trains, ships, buildings, industry, and non-CO2 gases, which are just kind of lumped even though they come from these sectors. So this would all be CO2, and this is the non-CO2 gases. And then we have three bars for each. One bar is showing us uh, 2030, Actually, the, the line is zero. So the, the lines here, right here, give us where we were in 2010. So this is the 2010, 2010. <laughs> this is showing 2030, 2050, and 2100. And then the full bar is, I can't remember if it's 100%. Yes, it is 100%. Mm -hmm. And then, it, so it's, this is the full distribution of models, and then in here is the 50th percent. So this isn't a reference case. And you can see that there's growth in pretty much all sectors. Now, one thing you'll notice is there's not a lot in buildings. That's because buildings use a lot of electricity. So their emissions are actually reflected over here in, in the electric sector. And that's partially true in industry as well. Okay. But this is a starting point. And you can see all the sectors largely are growing. Or somewhere they're not. But there's a lot of growth in the sectors. Now, here is a 450. Okay. This is a 450 where we have carbon dioxide capture and storage. That means we can... That means if we have bioenergy, we can grow bioenergy, it sequesters carbon, it grabs carbon from the atmosphere, we put an electric power plant, we burn it, and then we pump that carbon into the ground and we've actually reduced concentrations, okay? And so that technology, if you have it available, happens to make a ton of economic sense. So the first thing I just wanna point out is that you can see electricity by 2050 is, for most scenarios, almost completely decarbonized or electricity is a net sink of emissions. So that's in 35 years. That's not, that's not you know, 100 years from now. It's 35 years from now we're talking about. And then by, by the end of the century, it's, it's serving as an enormous net sink. And that's using bioenergy coupled with carbon dioxide capture and storage. Um, but you can also see that the other sectors uh, take emissions reductions as well. One of the things that comes out a lot from the models is that some of the sectors are easier or harder than others to, to decarbonize. So that's why you see electricity, we just go haywire on electricity because there's so many options. There's wind, there's solar, there's nuclear, there's CCS, there's bioenergy. So all of those are available. There's not so many options when it gets to transport. Transport's typically considered kind of the toughest nut to crack when you try and do emissions mitigation. There's not really great substitutes for liquid fuels. The energy content, the energy density is really so, I mean, in some places we can start using electric cars, but how well does that work with boats? How well does it work with transport around the planes and so forth? So it's typically considered among the harder sectors to get, out, get emissions out. Uh, any questions? Okay. So this is with CO2 carbon dioxide capture and storage. And I just want you to think about kind of the 2050. So we're talking globally, even with this growth, economic growth, we're talking about transport emissions being kind of at or maybe below where they are today, electricity being almost fully decarbonized, and so forth. Now the U.S. target, by the way, is, um, it's, I think it's for 26 to 28 percent by 2025. It is on line for an 80 percent reduction for the U.S. by 2050. Now whether we do that or not is not clear, but that's our, that's the target we put out. And if we were to do that, we really would be talking about decarbonizing electricity in the U.S. by 2050, if that were to go forward. Okay, now here's without carbon dioxide capture and storage. And I just want to point out that we don't get the negative emissions here. Instead, what we get is we're still going for dramatic reductions in electricity emissions, but just not as deep as before. So this is really, this is a big value of these models is to understand where the sectoral emissions reductions would come from. And in fact, it's informed a lot of policy. Even in the US, um, the notion of going out elect after electricity first both seems obvious intuitively, but the models have supported it. And so you see that, um, actually I think the Chinese will be doing the same when they say a low carbon target, it will primarily be out, out of electricity. But this has come from these models. Actually EMF24 and other earlier studies have just shown that 
economically, it's, it's more efficient to try and go after electricity. I mean, you do everything at once, don't get me wrong, but you can go deeper into electricity more quickly because of the options that are available. And a normal strategy that comes out of these models is decarbonize electricity, but sometimes you actually see electricity use increase with mitigation because you're trying to then pump electricity into cars, use it more for heat pumps as opposed to using um, gas furnaces and so forth. One question. Uh, do you have an idea how much dependent is a CCS scenario on a well established international CO2 market? So, in terms of making projects more feasible, because we, there is a certain price of CO2 zone on the market. Um, let me see if I so I may have to ask you a couple of questions and then turn the answer down. So, um, Almost all of these scenarios are assuming by 2050 that we have equalized costs across countries. So whether there's a market or not, oh. you have equal prices. And, and so, so to think about its viability out of that context, you'd have to be thinking about some countries moving more aggressively than others. Mm -hmm. Within that context, you do know that, for example, the US has vast reservoirs of storage. I think the Chinese have very good reservoirs of storage. My understanding, I'm not sure if anyone else knows, is that the Indian, the understanding of the Indian reservoir storage has gone down. Um, some countries simply can't use it. So in these scenarios, you won't see Japan, for example, using it unless they're doing offshore dumping of the energy. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I'm answering this. I, I, I think these these scenarios are largely assuming in 2050 we have a, a global international price on carbon. Yeah. Not to say that we really do, but it's just an easy way to do it. Yeah, no, my question was because China just announced that they are going to settle their um, establish a carbon market. Yeah, so great. I was wondering how close this new uh, uh, allow the feasibility of the CS market, uh, the CS market. Right, again, these are largely based, if they're economically efficient, they're yeah. based on this notion that you really sort of do have a market. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, the thing you find when you don't have a market, so this gets into sort of the economics of it, is that some sectors um, will be taking, they'll have a higher cost than other sectors. And so there's a general sense that at low levels of mitigation, that's not so bad. Like the U.S., it's kind of funny, the U.S. essentially, your, you know, your, your most market economy, more <laughs> market-based economy in the world, isn't using market-based instruments. Whereas China, which you would not think was as heavily market-based as the U.S., or at least that's you know, that's the pride of the U.S., is now going for market-based um, instruments. But the notion is that when you don't have market-based instruments and you just regulate, then you might be taking too much out of one sector and not enough out of another, and then it's economically inefficient, mm -hmm. and so it's you know lowers GDP more than it otherwise would. And there's a lot of research using really the energy economy models to look at that. Um, but there, you know, the CCS is interesting because it really does require a price on carbon. You still install some PV, some wind, nuclear without a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. But there is no reason at all to put in CCS unless there is some sort of price on carbon or incentive to do so. It just won't happen. But you still get a lot of the other technologies even without. It. Yeah. So you're saying there's not really at least you're thinking about issues with capacity of storage and maybe location of storage and some of the other questions that surround the actual storage of CO2 and the technology for doing that. Where are we with that? Yeah, so I'll answer as best I can. Um, so first, let me give you a generic answer. Um, I, I'll be able to go through in a moment and show you a scenario that takes us to 50% reductions in the U.S. using GCAM, something you'll kind of try and replicate. Um, in all of these scenarios, the deployment of, of this low carbon technology is just massive, as I said earlier. And it's pretty common, I don't know if I said this last time, but to go out and meet with the folks, let's say at DOE, and if I meet with the nuclear energy folks, they might look and they'll say, look how much solar and wind you're putting in. That's insane, you can't really put that much in. Um, or if I meet with the, the fossil people, they'll say, There's, that nuclear is too high because, uh, I, I, they don't actually all do this, this is actually a caricature, they're actually, some very, there's very good people. But the notion is, the, the thing of them pointing out other, I shouldn't say, but really they point out, no matter what, you point out that some of those deployments just seem huge. So I just want to put that on the table. It's only a partial answer to what you're saying. Um, but all of them have issues. So nuclear has you know, the big three. It's safety, um, it's waste, and it's proliferation, right? 
And then CCS, yeah, there's a lot of uh, testing that hasn't been done. We really just haven't done it enough, and so people don't know. But in, in CCS, there's really three phases. I have to actually give another talk on this next week. The first phase is right now, which is getting started. And that's about just getting point sources linked up to sinks. And a lot of that might be EOR, enhanced oil recovery. But as you go towards mid-century with the real high-level deployments, EOR is not your solution. You're talking about these deep sailing aquifers. So there's been a lot of attempt to map those out. The US is well mapped out. China's actually decently mapped out. There is a lot of reservoir capacity. There's, a, there's enough reservoir capacity globally to get us through the end of the century on these scenarios. That's, that's generally where the consensus is. When we run these sort of fun scenarios we ran to 2300, you start to run out of CCS. And in the end, you've got to move all to things like nuclear or silver. But over this century, that hasn't proven to be an issue. The issue is just nobody's doing it because you have to have a market. You have to actually be trying to reduce emissions to do it. That's the only way that you'll actually undertake CCS. But we're all doing nuclear anyway. We're all doing nuclear. We're all doing silver. So it's, it's right now, it's just in the ramp up phase. There's a really good picture from, from um, chapter seven, which is on energy supply, and it shows the amount of energy, CCS you'll store in 2030, 2050, 2100, and then you zoom in on the 2050, and then you show it compared to today. <laughs> today is like nothing, I mean the 2030, today is like nothing, and there's a huge amount of a ramp up. And I think I have a slide like that on wind that I think you guys will find interesting. Okay, so, um, I guess I won't go through this, but there's a lot of questions about energy efficiency. And one of the things, actually I will go through a little bit because I think in the context of integrated assessment, it's kind of interesting. One of the issues that comes up on the energy efficiency side is that there's a range of folks who do energy efficiency modeling from the bottom up, engineers. And, uh, they look at buildings and they say, how much can we get out? And here's the measures we can put in and here's how much we can get from buildings. And so there was a thought that those um, modelers would estimate much higher reductions than we would from the integrated assessment models. And so this is just showing a comparison. Um, but it's doing two things. One is it's showing the um, final energy demand reduction relative to the baseline. How much below the baseline, let's say in a 450, okay, 2030 and 2050. And so here in transport for a 450, it's anywhere from very little reduction to 50% reduction in energy in transport. And in buildings, by 20, by 2030, you know, you're down to a 40% reduction at the highest level, but most of them around, you know, 10 to 20% reduction um, in, in energy. Uh, so that's the first thing, is you do see these demand reductions relative to the baseline, that's not relative to today, that's relative to the baseline, and that's both installing better technologies and also just reducing demand, which is a welfare loss. Okay. Uh, but then this is some, some engineering studies. And so it was nice to do a comparison between the engineering studies and what was coming out of the integrated assessment models. And they weren't, you weren't, you didn't get this bias that the engineering studies were estimating sort of more potential. The sectoral studies were coming up with similar sorts of numbers. Okay, and then land use, which I think is important for this group. Um, this is a little hard to read, but let me just explain the point. This is showing land use change CO2 emissions, okay, across the scenarios, and we've got the same coloring, so blue is the 450s, right, and then moving, you know, basically moving this way, in essence. And uh, there's the cumulative fossil fuel and industrial CO2, okay, on the one axis, and here's the cumulative uh, land use change CO2 emissions, okay. And you can see out here on this end, you know, they kind of cluster in this area. There's typically cumulative um, some land use change emissions. But down here in the 450s, look, there's a bunch down here with a huge negative land use change emissions. Once you're pushing the system that hard, if you set up the model in a particular way, you say, look, I'm gonna give you an economic incentive to a forest, to actually put in forests, the model will put in a lot of forests because it's actually economically efficient to do so. The issue is that it runs up and runs into all sorts of issues of sort of, um, I'm going to say, land and agriculture have very strong ties to sort of societal systems and security and so forth. So you have to ask whether it's really making sense. But you get this huge spread down here. Are scenarios in which you're 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 planting a ton of trees? Okay, you're you're taking a bunch of crops or 
pasture that's inefficiently used and converting it to forest. That's one strategy. And that allows you to, to have to do less on the fossil fuel side. The other ones are scenarios up here where you're using a ton of bioenergy and you're not protecting your forests. And so you're just cutting down your forests. So both of those are in play. So the land use change emissions depend critically on the way the biomass is treated and the way the afforestation is treated. We actually had a science paper, um, of probably like four or five, maybe five or six, who knows how long ago now, a while back, that was, was looking at this, because we had gone in and we wanted to just say, look, would you really get as much bioenergy if you protected forests? You know, if you really put them off limits or you put an economic incentive to afforest on, and you really treated that as a real part of your mitigation portfolio, wouldn't that limit how much bioenergy you could use? And after we did that, the obvious happened which is, yeah, maybe it kind of dampened the biomass a little bit, but you've got this huge amount of carbon stored in land. Uh, and then a final thing to note here is these scenarios, nor the energy scenarios, include feedback from a changing, changing climate. So for the next round of the IPCC, the hope is to have them much more systematically included. So increases in building energy demand for electricity are not there, nor are the decreases in the use of gas for heating, but also the changes in yields, which can have a huge effect on agriculture are not in there as well, or, or in Latin America, there's a lot of concerns on one side, you have the Amazon getting wet from some models, on other models, it's drying out, and that has very different effects on land use, and none of that's in these models. None of that's included in the scenarios, I should say, for most of Okay, so here's a digression, so how much does the energy system have to change, getting at that question? <coughs> to limit temperature change. So I'm gonna use GKIM. And here's an, first I'm gonna do this little motivating slide though. So this is, this is from chapter six. And this is showing uh, uh, that final energy use. So the energy that's used by the consumer. Okay. And the low carbon component of primary energy, low carbon component of our energy system. And you can see over time, this is 1971 up through 2010, these, these, these uh, crosses. Um, you can see that basically energies our final energy is increasing. We're demanding more energy as we get richer, economies grow. And the total amount of low carbon energy is increasing as well. You know, we're putting in nuclear, we're putting in mostly nuclear and hydro actually, but now increasing the wind and solar. But then when we get into the scenarios, here's the reference, the baseline scenarios that kind of roughly continue this trend. This gets at the, the question that was being asked earlier. Here's the 550s. And here's the 450. So the 450 is basically try and put the brake on energy growth as much as they can. And then they're installing. So let's say this is 80. You know, they're getting up to 480 as much. You know, so these are these are dramatically higher low carbon. This is by 2050, over the next 35 years. Dramatic deployments of low carbon energy. So now let's talk about what that looks like. And to do that, I'm going to do three technology pathways in G. Okay. So one of them is gonna take us down to 2010 emissions by 2050. Another is gonna get us to 25% um, below, and then this one's 50% below. Remember that 40 to 70% number? That I said earlier, 40 to 70% reductions by 2050 are associated with two degrees globally. So we're gonna kind of work our way through. Here's a reference. Here's the 0% reduction compared to 2010. 25% and 50%. And I just wanna show you what they look like, because I think so first, um, oh, and I'm gonna do three different scenarios. One, all technology is available. One without bio-CCS, which is actually hard to do, but <coughs> it's sort of done here. And then one without, one without CCS or nuclear. And here's the primary energy. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't show the CCS because it would be more compelling if it did. Uh, but here's, here's the reference. Okay. Here's the 2010 emissions. And the gray is gonna be energy reduction. This should be non-biomass renewables, nuclear, biomass, coal, gas, and oil. Okay, so these three on the bottom are the fossil, and these are the non-emitting, and then that's energy reduction from the baseline. And then here's 25%, and then here's the 50%. And you can't see it on this chart, but this coal is entirely CCS. There's no coal without CCS in these scenarios. I'll show the electricity system in just a second. You can see out here, if we don't have CCS or nuclear, we have to have a huge amount of biomass in wind and solar. And just 
you think about this total amount here. So let's say by, let's say CCS doesn't work out, and we're not and nuclear's off the table. You sort of um, this amount here is no, it's not that different than our total 2010 energy system. In fact, if you go back, oops, go the wrong direction. Here's the reference. Um, you know, here you still have pretty large growth in non non on, uh, on, uh, non emitting technologies. Okay, so let me go down to now. Here's electricity. Same stuff. There's hash lines or CCS. Okay. So here's the twenty. This is um, flat. 25% reduction and 50% reduction. So this is the kind, and you can notice these actually have more electricity. I don't know if you can see that, but the electricity actually went up in these. It went down in this one because you don't have good electricity options. But in these, electricity went up. This is enormous amounts of low carbon energy associated with doing it. But what we do in the model is we say, okay, bio CCS, everything's available. Okay, we use a bunch of bio CCS. That's where you get the negative emissions. Okay, bio CCS isn't available. So now, in electricity, you've still got a bunch of CCS, but no bio CCS. And then here, neither are available. You have to reduce emissions substantially. It's all wind. But you can also see there's, there is, if you have bio CCS, you can keep a little bit more coal in here because you get the negative emissions. But if you don't have bio CCS, you got every bit of coal you have has CCS on it. So this is the character of what a two degree scenario looks like. I think that's, that's one of sort of been kind of a core purpose of this style of modeling. We'll do an example of that. And then I thought this would be useful to give you a more graphic sense of the scale. This is global installed wind capacity. Pretty exciting. Look, it's going up. It's going up really fast. If we're trying to deal with this problem, we've got these new technologies coming in, we can probably do it because look at this. I mean, it's like over the last whatever 15 years, it's grown dramatically. It's like an order of magnitude up to there. So this, you know, you think, well, we've got, you know, we've got hope. So now I'll put that here. That's this one <coughs> here, right there, up to here. And here are the wind deployments uh, going forward under those three different scenarios. If we have no CCS in nuclear, that thing, that's what I was just showing you. We go up to here, right? We have the full portfolio, it's there. And so it's not, this is not really by itself sufficient. We're talking orders of magnitude more. And just to give you a sense, we had about 320 gigawatts installed in 2013. In the high scenarios, it's 2,000 by 2030, 9,000 by 2050. And then 225 turbines, that's the actual number of turbines. 330,000 additional five megawatt turbines, another 1.4 million. So the notion here is to give you a sense of the scale that we're talking about to actually reach these goals. Okay, so then um, <coughs> go a little bit longer and then I can, we can take a break. Um, I think I'll leave a little bit more on this sort of working group three overview. And again, this is all IA models. So everything I've shown you is coming out of the IA models. They were actually the core of the core working group three uh, results. So now, get to this question about what if we don't do much now? This is the question that was asked earlier. So here's a, these are all quotes from the report. Delaying additional mitigation will substantially increase the challenges with limiting warming to below two degrees. Okay, so what does that mean? So this is, looks like a lot of chaos, but let me explain. So this is, um, this is a set of what we'll call immediate action scenarios. Okay. So this is showing emissions, right? And 2005 through 2030. And these are all scenarios that end up below 50 gigatons by 2030, okay? So these are immediate action scenarios, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just in a moment contrast that with delayed action scenarios. Here's the rate of CO2 emissions between 2030 and 2050, the rate of change. We're talking anywhere from about one to about 6% per year, depending on kind of where you were. Over that next, from 2030, so the Copenhagen, I'm not Copenhagen, the Paris stuff is talking about 2030, roughly speaking. So between 2030 and 2050, we're talking about decarbonizing the energy system, uh, decarbonizing the economy at a rate of, you know, let's say on average about 3% per year. So that's already substantially challenging. Here's history, <coughs> 1900 to 2010, and 
So let's say over the last, whatever you remember this earlier, was 2.2% from 2000 to 2010. So this is a dramatic difference from what we've been, what we've been talking about. And here's the share of low carbon energy. Uh, we're at, you know, around an average, let's say a little less than 60 <clears throat> by 2050, with an increase of 90% from 2010, uh, from 2030. So this is 2030, 2050, 2100. This is the 2010 level. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so now I say, this is what one of the big studies, it was called the Ampere study, focused on. What happens if we delay English? What's gonna happen? So here's the Cancun pledges. So 2020, hoping people actually make the Cancun pledges, which they may not. But here's the Cancun pledges. And let's say we just kind of extrapolated that up to here. What would that be? And I'm not gonna go through all the details of the energy system and so forth. I'm just gonna show you a couple of quick results. Okay. Well, instead of our average reduction per year being 3%, which is itself already quite challenging, now we're talking about a reduction on average about 6% per year. And in addition, because we did nothing to 2030, we didn't really install very much, we got to catch up super fast from 2030 to 2050. If you don't do much through 2030 and you still want to get to two degrees, you don't get to wait till the end of the century unless you're in scenarios where you go to incredibly large use of bioenergy with CCS in the end of the century and get gigantic emissions reductions like 20 gigatons. What happens instead, you don't do very much and then you got to just go for it like mad over the next 20 years. So in the IPCC context, just to digress, the goal here was not to say what can or can't happen. It was just to lay it out for people to see and then it can inform the way people think about the negotiating context. One could have said, you know, what we consistently got asked was, you know, is it possible if we get up to here to still reach two degrees? I, don't know. I mean, it's possible. You could tank the economy. You, you know, there's a, there's been times in history where we put in enormous amounts of energy quickly, like nuclear in the 70s. I don't know. So, but the goal was to say, look, this is what it would require. And this is all then out of the out of, out of the model. There are some areas though where you don't have to do this. And I think there's some down here because they go up like this, and then at the end of the century, like I said earlier, they're like 20 gigatons a day. And sure, if you do that, then you don't have to do very much now. Okay, economic costs. So, um, one of the questions folks have is how much is it gonna cost to reduce emissions? Well, a core benefit of having these integrated assessment models is you can actually start to look at some cost metrics. You can look at carbon prices, you can look at effects on fossil fuel prices, and so forth. Um, I'm in a moment gonna contrast this question with a question I think is, is equally or potentially more relevant, um, which has to do with who wins and who loses because that's actually what affects the negotiations. Um, I'm gonna do that on a sectoral basis, but let's just start with the question everybody asked from the start, which is, this is gonna be super expensive, right, to reduce emissions? Okay, so let me show you where we ended up, and this is gonna take a, a moment to go through, but I'll explain it, because it's kind of interesting. It gets into both what the results show and also how one expresses the results. So first off, how do you think about what scenario to do the costs on? Do you want to do a, the cost based on a US style scenario, regulatory approach in electricity, uh, building standards, cafe standards, particular measures in non CO2 gases? Or do you want to do it with an economy wide carbon price? Those can have dramatically different costs. Do you want to have it so all countries around the world are reducing so they get to the same marginal cost? Or do you want some countries to do a bunch early? others wait and then do a ton at once, how do you want to do that, right? And so your actual implementation may not be the least cost. <coughs> so the way we typically start is we just assume a perfect implementation, which is what we'll do with you. Just assume global carbon price across all sectors, all parts of the economy, and you, and you roll it forward. And in that context, here are the changes in reduction in consumption that's a, for those who aren't economists, that's, that's just, that's an economic measure of how much you consume, right? That's what it's called consumption. Roughly speaking, it's going to be comparable with that kind of change. Okay. So you can think about it that way if it makes it easier. But for, for the economists, it's important to have a very strict welfare measure. So um, here we are. Let's do the 450s. In 2100, 
the 16th to 84th percentile were from about 3 to 11 percent less consumption than we were in the reference case. Okay, not that today, in the reference case. So, first thing I want you to just know that's a huge range, right? That's an enormous range, right? So, to ask what's the cost of mitigation going to be? Well, Let's see, it's kind of almost an order of magnitude across the models, and just is just the 16th to the 84th, so I'm excluding one third of the model runs. There's model runs up here that have very high costs, and there's models down here that have very low costs. So as much as these models are economic models, I actually think a strength they have as economic models is their ability to understand how to allocate resources within the economy. So how are decisions made in some sense? But the welfare measures are very, very low. And so going out 100 years, how do you even understand what it's going to do to change? That could be very tough. Um, so then you ask, well, OK, is this big or small? So people want to know, is this big or small? And I don't know. I mean, do you guys think it's big or do you think it's small? So it's anywhere. Let's say it was, let's say it was this. Let's say it was 5% below baseline GDP. That's the baseline GDP. In, 20, in 2100, is that big or a small number? Or neither, is it a medium number? Or it's big, it's small. I don't know, so, okay. Okay, it's big. So let me give you a couple of ways to think about this. Okay, first, um, well, it's 5% compared to growth, which is about 700% compared to 2003. So, okay, so, we're still we're a lot bigger, so it's five percent less from seven hundred percent. So how big can we do this? Okay, so that's one way to look at it. Um, we didn't do it, but you can compare it to costs of things like healthcare or stuff like that, and that might give you a different answer. Another way you could do it is say, okay, this number five percent sounds really big, but you know what sounds smaller than that? 004 percent. This is the change in the growth rate of GDP that gets you to that, to that level. It's between point, so let's just say on average, it's 0.06%. So instead of growing at 2% per year, we're growing at 1.94, right? So, but you know, that really builds up by the end of the century. So what you get is these sort of different impressions of how to do it straight up. Sounds like a lot. Compare it to here, it makes you think it's smaller. But at the same time, if you compare it to other costs, maybe it doesn't seem so small. Or express it in growth rates, which kind of makes it seem, definitely makes it seem small. But the key thing from my, my point of view is, is one, that these are idealized scenarios, or key things. Second, the uncertainty range is huge. It's just a huge range. We don't have a good handle on the cost of mitigation. Don't let anybody tell you we know how much it's gonna cost to reduce emissions. We don't have a good handle. And then finally, if we didn't do idealized, you know, some folks have actually gotten scenarios where, actually not just idealized, where they think about climate mitigation interacting <coughs> with other distortions in the economy, so helping to, to foster innovation or serve other means, and they've actually gotten it increasing GDP. And then other people get enormously high costs. So it's just, it, it's really, really all over the place. None of these take into account the benefits of mitigation. This is only the cost of mitigation. It's not talking about what we get from it. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so then the last point I'll make, and then we can think. Let's see, where do I want to, what do I have? Do I have one? I'm not going to do that. Okay, so I'm going to do two more slides. So, and then we'll take a break. So, that was this total cost thing. And that's for this debate about should we reduce emissions? You know, should we undertake climate mitigation? And the question is, do the, do the costs outweigh, do the benefits outweigh the costs? So we're going to go and we have all this uncertainty about what the damages are. And I didn't show you, you guys are probably all familiar with the burning embers diagrams. It's the, these are the burning ember diagrams. You know, um, I should have put that on. I, I really just focused on the integrated assessment model. But in, in work group two, they're talking about what are the damages from climate change. So there's a famous style of diagram called burning embers. And it shows, say, five bars, one for like, ecosystems or threatened species and each bar then has colors going from like yellow to deep purple but not not the band deep purple for those who know you're old enough this. but anyway so um, from yellow up to very dark and it's got temperature here and it just basically that's the way they talk about climate impacts that's about the best we can do in many ways there's some economic estimates but they're really 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 
really poor because we just don't have the experience. So it's a sort of color gradation. In two degrees, it's starting to turn purple in one of the bars. I can't remember which one. Um, so that's the way we're thinking about the benefits. And then the costs is what we're thinking about, what I just showed you. And that's, you know, that's the analytical way one would think about what the right, not analytical, that's the formal mathematical way that one would think about the balance. But that's how those things play out within that context of trying to understand what the balance is. But in reality, the big issue is not really just about whether it's a good idea or not. I'm not sure we really have that under control, whether it's a good idea to reduce emissions. Because it's so, you know, it's, it's, the benefits are so uncertain, it really depends on how you see risk. Um, but what is important in addition, that is important, but what's also important in addition is what it does for particular countries or sectors. And so this is showing change in um, over annual investment from 2010 to 29, so the, 2029. So over the next 20 years, actually including five that have already happened, but over 20 years in 450 and 500 ppm scenarios. So like, you know, like two to roughly above two um, degree scenarios, likely chance. Um, and it's showing the change in annual in, um, investment um, as you go into those scenarios. And it's showing them for the, the OECD, sort of rich countries, the non-OECD, the previously not rich, and the whole world. And it's changing, the, this is in annual investment flows in billion of US dollars per year, billions of US dollars, okay? So renewables, hey, you know. So we're talking total world, maybe 100 billion more cumulative investment in renewables. But there's an industry that's probably got some good lobbying uh, for, the, uh, for, for mitigation. Nuclear, yeah, potentially as well. You know, depending on how that plays out. Power plants with CCS investment, here you go. Fossil fuel power plants without CCS, you know, on average here is like, actually the average is like 20 billion, but some down to less than that. Extraction of fossil fuels, okay? And that's not, that's actually the, that's actually the investment. That's also not the reduction in the value of the assets that are under the ground, which is potentially even higher. And acknowledging this, I think, is really important in, in the context of climate change. It's this kind of stuff is who's paying, who's being affected, that matters a lot. If you're in the negotiating, negotiating or in the IPCC process, um, there will be folks from the oil producing countries. And it's really important to them, and I think my own, just my own personal perspective, I think it's important to acknowledge with written conclusions in the summary of the policymaker that mitigation will have a negative impact on the economic well-being of, of oil exporting countries. No question about it. And that's just a reality that we have to acknowledge. Um, a lot of this is coming out of what's called the limit study, where it's explicitly about sort of about um, investment activities in the context of mitigation. Okay, so then let me give you one more area in which I'm not gonna do that. Final thing. So um, let me talk a little bit about this notion of looking beyond just simply costs and energy. A lot of the discussion now in mitigation has to do not just with, um, not just with mitigation, but how mitigation links up to other societal priorities. And that's actually a place where integrated assessment model is, modeling is increasingly moving. We're doing some of it. There's folks at YASA in, um, in Austria who are doing a lot, I think are leading a lot of the work in that area. Uh, but it's particularly important to sort of in this sort of rich versus poor country context. Um, if I were to do sort of a caricature, if you think about the Europeans, it's very much just mitigation. We need to just reduce emissions. But if you think about countries that are growing, um, that are developing countries, it's about you know it's about energy security, right? It's about economic growth. It's about um, energy access. It's about all these other issues. It's about air pollution. And so linking up the model, linking up this mitigation to these other issues is a huge issue. We already know that say linking up to oil exporting countries, it's a negative, right? Then the question is, is it a positive in some other ways? And so I just want to give this as an example. Actually, I'm not totally on top of this. This was done by the EASA folks. Um, but this is just showing that when you do mitigation, you actually do potentially typically get a, a pollution effect. There's a lot of questions about whether you really like energy access effects and stuff, that's not so clear. So some of these, it's kind of a mixed bag in some ways. If I had an expert here, they could probably say a little bit more about where it is on balance. 
but you can use the tools to do this. And so this is taking integrated assessment models, running them, and then taking, um, I believe, taking outputs from those scenarios in terms of say electric or transport emissions and associating emissions factors and then assessing the, the, um, the effects of mitigation, I guess, here on PM10. Okay. And so it's trying to understand the linkage between climate mitigation and air pollution. And this is a very viable way to go. A lot of the work now is trying to do it and take regions and then apply very sophisticated, um, uh, uh, what's the right word, air modeling, whatever it is, you know, um, models that are looking at local regions and trying to model the way that, that, uh, that uh, pollutants are transported over, over space. Um, you know, you know, it looks like, I mean, the, the chart on the left is, uh, is, is change, is relative, but it's, it, are the maps, are these circles on the maps are absolute or these are also relatives? Because, I actually don't know. Right, because you could argue, I mean, I mean, the, the picture that looks horrible, but you could argue, so what, I mean, other scenarios may have similar pictures, we just, we just not yeah, seeing exactly. the change. Yeah, exactly, I don't know the answer. Yeah, I think yeah. this is the only one that you can really Right, right, to. so that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's not so bad. In some sense, you're getting, this should be base, this should be, yeah, good, exactly. Baseline yeah. and the mitigation, so you get better. It's actually a big debate. We get this upstairs all the time, not upstairs, downstairs all the time, because we have folks who work on short-lived pollutants. Yeah. And there's a big debate about what the baseline should be, because you actually assume that as countries get richer, they will install policies. They will put in place policies to deal with air pollution. That's sort of this normal, normal way that economies advance. So do you put those in and take credit for it or not? What's the right baseline that you should go against? Um, and so that's why you see in many of these, you're seeing that even the baseline, you have these decreases because you're assuming with economic growth, there's more pollution regulation. So we typically have that in GCAM as well. But really, it's just an input. Okay, and I won't go into the, I, I'm certainly now, why don't we take a break, and then afterwards I'll, I'll go through some of the, uh, the gas. The gas. Okay. A little uncertainty in the gap in context. Whenever you're doing these model runs, it's the same thing we're just talking about. These guys can't, you know, they're having trouble predicting out in several days. We're predicting out years into the future. And so uncertainty is just a huge deal. I thought it'd just be kind of interesting to say a little bit about how the IPCC handles uncertainty. Here, as pointed out, is the burning embers. That's what I was talking about earlier. But there's uncertainty everywhere. You know, how do they think about this? Is how they're expressing uncertainty by these levels of additional risk and these kind of shaded bars. This is uncertainty in temperature around the RCPs from a set of models. It's not even the full uncertainty because it's really models trying to do best. Here's our uncertainty cost. There's all these uncertainties. And the IPCC, it's kind of interesting. So they have moved to kind of two parts. There's no right way to do this. It's easy to be negative about this. I actually gave a talk recently that was kind of negative about it, but it's not, it's just no right way to do it. But the way they've done is they've got statements like that are that are expressed in likelihood. And the notion, there's two notions here. One is that that's easy, in some sense, or easier to convey, but there's also circumstances where you don't have quantitative information. And so using likelihood statements is really useful. So, you know, here it is. Global, this is a core result. Global surface temperature change for the end of the 21st century is likely to exceed 1.5 degrees for all RCP scenarios except for 2.6. It is likely to exceed 2 degrees for RCP 6, blah, 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 and more likely than not, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, this is, this is as good as it gets, you know, we do all this probabilistic assessment, but in the end, you know, these, these, these um, strong quantitative measures ultimately are not capturing all of these, <coughs> and uncertainty and also inherently has subjective character to it, so that makes it complicated. But I will note, note this, though, that likely statements do have an underlying meaning. This is from the official guidance. So. Like I was saying earlier, exceptionally unlikely, zero to 1%, very unlikely, zero to 10. So although they have this qualitative meaning, they actually have a quantitative meaning as well. And then in addition to that, um, the IPCC uses confidence statements. So it's really, it's kind of a, a catch as catch can, depending on which one you use. But sometimes you'll say something's likely to happen. Other times they'll say like this, the Arctic region will warm more rapidly than the global mean and mean warming over land will be larger than over the ocean. Okay, that's a factual statement. So instead of saying it's likely or not likely, then they just qualify it by very high confidence. So it's 
So in this case, you potentially could have said it is likely or very likely that this will happen, but instead they use the confidence statement. And there's a, there's a complex, not a complex, but there's an uncertainty guidance that goes in about how to do this. But this is, in the end, this is how the stuff plays out. And the way we ended up doing it was we ended up just saying um, high confidence for everything because we would say that the range of the models, the 16th and 84th percentile range is X. It's just a factual statement. There wasn't anything in any sort of any uncertainty statement. There's other, just it's important to point out, you do a lot of quantitative analysis, you think about quantitative uncertainty estimates, you have to realize kind of what sort of system they, and decision they came to. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the natural gas. I'll try and do this in about a half hour and then we can get out a little early. So this is another really good example of using, of using the models to understand um, here an issue that's been on people's minds. So for those of uh, us who've spent a lot of time in the U.S., we know that there's an, there's, uh, the U.S. Has, um, um, has found that they have very large reserves of natural gas if you do fracking. And in fact, if you look across the globe, that's true in a lot of places. China actually potentially has large reserves, but it's a very different geology, so maybe it'll be a little bit harder to get to. Um, so the question, so now people are saying, well, look, gas, gas is this great fuel. Um, can this serve us as a part of our goal to reduce emissions? Can this be part of our climate strategy? Okay. There's really two parts to that question. And we did a paper, this was, this was in Nature, and it was only one of those parts, okay? The second one will be coming in some time, but probably won't be in Nature. Um, uh, the first question is, let's say we don't have any policy at all. Just having this gas, it's, it's not as carbon, you know, it's not as carbonaceous as coal. Is this going to reduce emissions? Is this gas going to give us a benefit? Just having it. The second question then is if we are going to reduce emissions, can gas, you know, really we're going to try and get down to 80%, what's the role of gas? So we were just asking the first of these questions. You know, is gas kind of going to take care of our problem by itself? And some of it's kind of obvious because it can't in some sense all the way because its carbon content is like 15, coal's like 25. So it can get you like half roughly halfway there, 40%, okay? Actually, coal can be a little higher. But anyway, so, you know, in that sense, but will that benefit be really large? What's gonna be the benefit of doing that? And so IA models are perfect for exploring that kind of question because they're gonna go from the energy system, uh, they're gonna look at emissions, and then we'll take it all the way up to radiant force. So we put together a set of, a team, it includes um, Brian Fisher um, in Australia, uh, the ASA folks, so these are the, Volker and K1 are two big modelers. Um, the folks from, I'm sure it's called CMCC, it's usually called FEM in, um, in Italy. They actually have a, they have a place on an island in Venice, which is really nice to visit. <laughs> Us, um, uh, and then Potsdam Institute uh, for Climate Change Research, or Climate Impacts Research, but PIC. And then Brian Kleiner he used to be at Exxon as part of the project with us. Um, so, and this is just showing the, since this is an integrated assessment modeling class, showing that there's a bunch of different models and they, they all have the same diet. You know, they all have diagrams, so they're similar. <laughs> but I will say that um, if I go up on these, I'll actually do it by these. I, actually, well, maybe I can tell which is which. Let's see. I don't know which is which. So, uh, BA economics is really just a CG, it's a CGE, it's just an economy with a very loose energy system. It doesn't really even have a climate portion. I shouldn't say it doesn't even. It's very detailed on its economy. These guys at Yasa have a model that in many ways is kind of comparable to us in its, its scope um, called Message. And the PIC folks are moving in that direction as well. So all of us are now trying to incorporate water into the models. We're actually probably at this point caught a little bit in front on the water stuff because we started earlier, but we're all doing that. We all have land use and so forth. We actually. One difference for us, neither better or worse, is have most of that stuff in the model in one framework. Typically, PIC and uh, Nyasa have different groups working on different parts, and they'll just kind of sort of sneaker back and forth. It has advantages and disadvantages. Um, and then these folks at FEME have what I would call kind of an intermediate complexity model. It doesn't have the level of detail in the energy or other systems that any of these three have. In fact, I'm not even sure how much land they have right now. But because it's simpler, you can do a lot of these really cool optimization and certain analyses that are harder for us to do. So it's really it's a really cool, cool model. 
Okay, so it's gonna be real simple, classic IA model experiment. Um, let me explain what these curves are, and then I'll show you the results. So these are throwing, showing three supply curves for natural gas. Okay? So uh, the economists always put the price on the vertical axis and the quantity on the horizontal axis. Okay, that's the economist style. So a supply curve always goes up like that, and it's convex going up like this. And this is showing exajoules of gas underground available and this is showing the production cost okay for that gas um, and there's three of these different curves and let me just explain what they meant for the paper um, in the end what matters is we put them in the paper but they have a meaning in terms of what we're trying to show if you went back over time folks didn't even think we could get to some of these deep reserves like like um, uh, the shales okay or I mean, um, so tight gas and so forth they didn't think we could do the fracking so really this, the conventional gas is this assumption that's just conventional reserves, none of, none of these unconventional reserves. Then as you got into the early 2000s, there was a sense that we could actually get into some of these reserves. I'm not sure if you guys paid a lot of attention, but there's a the gas boom in the US. It's a big gas boom. Mm -hmm. We're sitting on a, a lot of gas. And so um, that's this notion that in some sense that, well, look, we actually get it all these reserves. We can do this frack and you get it all this. And then there's this notion that, in fact, this, the, the gas is actually going to be a lot cheaper than we thought. It's not even that expensive to do the fracking. And that's kind of, in a sense, what's happened. And so the question is, you know, the, you know for example, the U.S. Is, is, uh, you know, puts a lot of value in this resource. And it's, you know, it's economically quite valuable. Will utilizing it reduce, reduce, reduce emissions? Is it going to be part of what's going to help us? So to do that, we want to put into the model two different curves. I think, we're, I think it's this and this will do. So the conventional versus the abundant gas. Okay, we're gonna put in those two curves. This is both cheaper and you got more. This is more expensive and you got less. And then what we wanna do is say, what are gonna be the climate implications of this? Now these are global curves. We actually have to do it by every region. And we're allowing some regions to come in a little bit later. So the US gets theirs immediately, China gets theirs a little bit later and so forth. But we put this in the model and then wanna assess what the implications will be. So I'm gonna go through first our results, um, and then I'll show the other models. So first, the, so the red is gonna be conventional gas, and then the blue is gonna be abundant gas. And this, don't worry about the gray, it's actually a range from a, from a, a study, but let's just call, concentrate on our lines. So there's gas consumption through 2050 with the uh, regular gas, here's the abundant gas. Gas is cheaper, we use a lot more gas. Okay, so we're, that's the first thing. We use more gas because it's cheaper. There's no climate policy. It's just using mm -hmm. more gas. Okay, so what about CO2 emissions? Mm -hmm. So what's your guess? What's going to happen to CO2 emissions? Say up. Oh. Are you raising your hand? No, no, I'm saying it goes up. Let's see. Any other guesses? Okay, let's see. Oh, we'll oh, see how it does. Oh, it is going down. <laughs> <laughs> When we first did this, uh, so it was hey, you mean, it was hey, a one came in. And, uh, we were sitting in the room because we had this exact bet. It was like, is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? I don't know. And uh, and he came in and it lay exactly on top of it. Like, did you actually just plot the same run? But no, it it really it has. So okay, it's slightly down. Come on, so it's basically not changing. That's the bottom line. It's not changing much. Okay. So what happens to radiative forcing? Oh, there's the radio forcing. It's actually a little bit higher. <coughs> radio forcing is not the same as the reduction of emissions. And that's going to be because of the methane and the CO2 forcers. And I'll get into that in just a moment. And temperature change. Hmm. Okay. So that was from our model. And I'm going to go through the reasons for this in just a moment. So that's GCAM. Here's message. A lot more gas. Oh, but look. Hmm. There's the emissions. Yeah. Let's see. Did you guys read it from there? Can you see it? Yeah. Here's Rima. Oh, message was from YASA. Um, I, actually, let me just say a little bit about it. So YASA is uh, International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis. I'll introduce each of these a little bit more as I go. They're in Luxembourg in Austria, outside of Vienna. They're not a bad place to visit as well. Um, and in fact, for anybody who's interested, they have a summer program, and so you can apply, and they house you there, and you do research for three months, and stay in Luxembourg near Vienna. Are the ones that go to work in the castle? 
It's 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 um it's not a castle, but it is a. <laughs> you were told it was a castle. It's okay. It's it's a it's a it's an old building which has both its good and bad parts. It's really cool because you pull up and it's kind of a courtyard. It's like a it's like a a, a royal retreat basically. But you know, like it's cool inside because it's got giant old rooms. But I don't remember if they have air conditioning. So so the folks we work after actually live in a building. Work in a building that's off to the side. So. New, <laughs> new building. Um, but anyway, she could do meetings there. It's pretty cool. But they, they, they were around. I think at the time. Um, I think it was actually. I think this is right. Um, let's give this a seventy percent. This is likely right. <laughs> that uh, they were originally constructed um, as a place to have sort of um, Eastern Europe, so Soviet bloc and Western researchers work together. And um, so they do a lot of stuff. The modeling is just part of it. They, they do a lot of stuff. Um, well, now there's more, so forget that other one. So that's changed now because that, that sort of imperative is no longer around. Um, but they, um, they do the modeling like we do, um, but they do a lot of stuff um, on sort of developing country um, co-benefits issues, kind of like I was talking about earlier, but really focused on, on more uh, focused work on the countries. They do a lot of air pollution work. So they do a lot of different stuff, and the modeling is just part of what they, what they do. Remind is the Potsdam Institute. And they've really, over the last like six, seven years, come from almost no model, just a very limited modeling capability to a very substantial modeling capability. They, the uh, the Germans have poured a lot of money into this into this area. Uh, so there are a lot of new new and younger people coming in with Remind. Both of these are optimization, internet temporal optimization models. Uh, which is the one I was telling you earlier, um, which is which is uh, from uh, what's called intermediate complexity and is from, uh, from Italy. Uh, okay, so here we go, full reinforcing almost no change. You can see there's a little bit more in Riemann. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that which was this foundation was created, someone had, a, I can't remember, some, somebody had some wealth or some sort of created this foundation to do this style of research. So they're a little bit smaller. And both Yasa and uh, Pick are both pretty big organizations. Um, with a lot of stuff they do besides just the modeling. And then BHE Gem is probably, these guys are a pretty small, small group that um, Brian Fisher works with. He used to be involved in some of the negotiating process for the Australian government. Um, anyway, so here's BAE Gem, BAE Gem, and you can see the results. So we're all getting basically the same result. So it's, they all agree that there is no change in, in CO2 overall CO2 emissions are? Very, pretty modest. Yeah. Yeah, why, is, why is that? That's a good question. Let's think about that. Hmm. Okay, so let's try and pull that apart, okay? So first, let's focus on the CO2, not the total forcing, because the forcing includes non short loop forcers and CH4, right? Because that's what gas is. Um, so let's look at um, what changes in the energy system between the two scenarios, okay? So this is in 2050. Okay. I'll just walk you through with this chart. This is 2050. And this is showing the change in energy compared to the conventional gas scenario. So it's the change from the conventional gas to the abundant gas scenario. And it's showing it in industry, buildings, transport, and electricity. Okay, so those four sectors. Gas is gonna be blue. Okay. Coal is gonna be gray. Liquid fuels, which is largely gas, um, oil, are gonna be red. And then you have biomass and, and nuclear is, is yellow, renewables are purple, okay? So let's just take uh, Remind, for example. So in, in um, industry and buildings, they are displacing coal and oil, okay? And I guess they're including more gas, and then what is this that they're adding? Oh, they're using more electricity in industry and buildings. It's kind of hard to handle that. But let's look here. Electricity is typically the largest. So you're using more gas, using less coal, but hey, you're using less renewables and you're using less, less nuclear. That's the reason. The bottom line, I think, I think there's a slide later. Here it is. Okay. If you only displace coal, you will get some benefit. But this is an economic situation. We're not applying any policies to ensure you just displace coal. The fact of the matter is if you have more gas, you're gonna displace every energy technology which is competing against, mm -hmm. okay? 
Um, and that's actually a big lesson from the analysis. I mean, it's obvious in retrospect, but the notion is if you don't have complementary policies to ensure that you're only replacing coal, then it's not clear you're gonna get that much benefit from the gas. Okay. So natural gas, carbon content, 14, coal, 27, okay? Average global in 2010, 16. Okay, so if you just displace the average global, you're, no, you're not getting nearly the same effect. Okay, now there are some regional differences. US 16, China 22, lots of coal in China, right? And I'll show you a slide in a moment. You do actually get a benefit in China, but you're not gonna get it on global, on, 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 in total across the whole world. And you can see it's roughly the same story. The, the key thing across these different models, it's the same sort of story. So, you know, here's GCAM, we're not getting nearly as big effect, we were smaller, I guess not the smallest, well, whatever, mid-sized, but we're getting the same effect. It's, it's displacing not just coal. So that's gonna be the CO2 story. Um, but the, that's only part of the story because then you have to ask what happens um, to radiative forcing from the other substances. So does that make sense, mm -hmm. why it is? And it's, you know, actually, give me just a step back to it. It's really, you know, it's an intuitive thing, and a lot of times you're using the model just to confirm your intuition. Um, or, you know, because you know, sometimes you find that your intuition intuition was wrong. Actually, I, uh, a, a colleague today was just telling me that they did some runs where they didn't use bioenergy, but they still got deforestation in these particular scenarios. And it had something to do with the way that the scenario is being run, the fertilizer was there was more costly. That drove down yields, used more land, that led to more deforestation. You know, and, and he thought it was extremely cool because he was like, wow, I was not expecting that. So sometimes you're just doing it to confirm your intuition. And the intuition came out, we actually didn't know which way, but it came out that way. Um, anyways, but it's, in the end, it's, you know, it's like, this is a very easy story to tell. If you're not gonna make sure that it displaces only coal, this is what's gonna happen. And it's true. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the fact of the matter. Okay, so then what happens to radiative forcing? You can see, to remember if I can do this right, um, so this should be showing the difference. Um, no, this is showing radiative forcing in 2050 here, and this is the difference between the two scenarios. So let me just focus on that, okay? Um, I have to make sure I'm doing it right. So um, CO2 is gonna be the first bar, and so you can see like Remine's got a little bit more CO2. <coughs> We have almost no difference, CO2 a little bit less, BAG, EGM, but that's not the whole story. So message is almost no difference, but then there's CH4, right? Because that's what natural gas is. And there was actually a really big debate, I don't know, it's probably like five, not debate, but about five years ago or so, this guy Howarth wrote an article that indicated that the leakage from natural gas could be enormous. And I think there's been a lot of debate about whether those were really kind of high end estimates. I think the expectation now is that it'll probably end up high. Um, so I don't know if I put in the sensitivity. No, I didn't. So I only have one more slide. But we did um, some sensitivities on these, not as high as a Howard, but you still get roughly the same, the same sort of numbers, even with higher leakage, leakage estimates. Unfortunately, I don't have pay one data, so he wouldn't know what they are. Um, but anyway, so you can see there is a little bit of that effect. And then the other thing is the aerosols. So if you do have the gas, if it does displace coal, if it does go into transport, then it will cut down on aerosols. And some of these are cooling aerosols. And so in fact, the gas, like in Remind, the bigger effect, the biggest effect, is actually the aerosol effect. Um, and this raises a, 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 I mean, this brings to mind another thing that we had seen some years ago, which is if you, Sometimes when you apply a carbon price in places like China, when you reduce emissions, you actually, you can have, you can have um, temperature go up briefly. How's this work? But forcing go up briefly because, forcing because you get rid of some of the cooling aerosols. And there's this sort of notion that right now we're getting a lot of cooling aerosols. And once we try and mitigate and get rid of all that coal, we're gonna lose that benefit. And so that could actually increase the rate of climate change. And so, yeah, and so the aerosols then are potentially a large effect as well. But you can see there's very different estimates of what the aerosol effect is. And then the regional changes can be very different as well because of these regional differences in the carbon intensity of the economy. So for the US, 
it actually gets us an increase. Actually, you know what? I forgot one thing. I'm so sorry. Let me go back up. There's actually two effects. One is the substitution effect. Okay, so what you're substituting for. And in general, it does make you slightly better off. Okay? In general, it does. But at the same time, gas is cheap. If gas is cheap, energy is cheap. And if energy is cheap, what happens? You use more energy. <coughs> so there's, there's, there's both a scale effect, which drives up emissions, and then there's a, there's a substitution effect, which tends to drive it down. And those two end up roughly balancing. Okay, and then regional changes in carbon emissions, that's where I was ending up. So you can see with the US, we're actually going up. So those two effects, of, you know, scale is definitely going up, and then um, the substitution isn't that great anyway, because you saw the average intensity of our economy is like 16 right now compared to 14. So you're, you're not gonna get that big of a benefit from the substitution anyway, whereas China could get an extremely large benefit from gas. And if anyone's been following China, they're not doing it for this reason, but China is, is working to get gas. So they, they've already got some pipelines in, I can't remember where they come through, but it's almost went through, through the Central Asia. And now they've got an agreement with the Russians to pipe in more gas, <laughs> um, which will take a long time. Um, but they're potentially moving towards you know, an increased use of gas. And then there's a lot of questions with gas about how much this will be LNG versus pipelines. Mm -hmm. So recent work we've been doing following on this is actually building out so we have a more explicit pipeline gas trade um, and um, an LNG trade. This LNG costs. You gotta pressurize it, it takes energy, it costs more to transport. It's not just like oil. You know, typically you say once you get something on a boat, it costs nothing. You know, it just kind of floats wherever you're going. That's not exactly true, but it's sort of true. But with gas, it's different. When you do the uh, liquefied natural gas, it actually takes quite a bit of work to get that top. Is that other one like Southeast Asia? What's that? Yeah, Southeast Asia. Yeah, and I don't know why it's up and then down. It could be, I don't know. And this, I should also note that this particular study is done assuming very fluid, as it were, markets for gas. So this is not assuming like any cost. Actually, this does have a cost for LNG, but it assumes everything is kind of an LNG trade and there's no sort of bilateral trade agreements or pipeline. It's just done in a very simple way. For, uh, for us, this is just from G. Campbell. And it does actually influence gas trade as well, which is really interesting. Okay, so that's, that's all I have for today. Um, I will send a note. Well, actually, let me tell you this, and then if there's any questions, we can discuss any other topics. I will send a note with just sort of a quick assignment on what to do, and then we can try and have Mateo up here um, uh, on Wednesday, Wednesday. at 4 30. Help folks do the run the model. And we'll just do something simple. All I want to do is just say, go back to back to this, the scenario that I showed with GCAM. Do something just comparable with that, and then see if folks can pull out uh, electricity system changes. Or if they want to do something different, that's fine too. But to go back and do something that I took a long time. Like, like this. And, mm -hmm. and, then, and potentially then plot we won't do all, just do the model, run it with a baseline, see if you can pull out the actual energy system. We'll run it with one carbon constraint scenario and then pull out the energy system. And it'd be fun to actually just pick a country or a region, you know, but then do something like that. And then we were thinking that maybe you worked for to do this. Maybe we just have those show a slide or something. Right. Each, each person or something. Just something to kind of see what we get. Yeah, we would do that on the Monday, right? On the Monday, yeah. Yep. We have to get that worked out. Yep. But it's, hopefully it should be pretty easy. Um, but again, it's easy once you get this thing rolling because it's the kind of stuff you run into. But I think it'll be really useful. And it opens the door. Okay, so with that, any any questions about all this stuff? I had kind of a specific question that's um, with natural gas and things like uh, when I think it was 2011 where there was quick exploration, not enough infrastructure. So in the Bakken Shale, they had to flare about a third of the natural gas that they otherwise would have produced. They didn't vent it, obviously, because that would be worse, but they right. they flared it. Is that something that's common? Or, I mean, it's avoidable, obviously, if you say, well, we've got to put the infrastructure in, but the race to just 
get to the resource is pretty big and you can't I, lose a lot. I don't know the answer to that. That's something we'll just have to ask. Because I do, I do think that flaring is quite common. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's better like than it, just sending not, methane up, but it's still that, not good. Yeah, not here. Yeah. It's not necessarily, it's, I don't know how common it is here, but I think if you go to, to places like uh, the Middle East, I think flaring is quite yeah. common because they're not shipping them around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but same, no, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, same in Venezuela. Is it? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Because they're not shipping the gas, yeah. right? So you lose. But I, thought, I think the Colombians want, I'm mm -hmm. trying to, I thought there was some sort of pipeline thing they were going to do between Venezuela and. Yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I haven't kept up, but I know the flaring went, you know, went on and as day in day out. Any other questions? Okay, so the, then the logistics are for Wednesday. So Mateo is going to come. Yeah. Okay. Mateo is a postdoc. Okay. Good. He's doing a lot of work. So. Good. Okay. Good. Oh. Well, well, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I think next week also then Muhammad will start um, talking about the water. water.